Hello, welcome to the Fancy Scientist podcast. I have an incredible guest for you today. His name is John Waterman. He is the author of 15 books. His latest book, Atlas of Wild America, we talk about in depth. It is with National Geographic. He is a science writer. And if you're not on YouTube, you can't see me, but I'm holding up this book. It is incredible. It's a gigantic book full of beautiful photos and maps of wild areas. So we talk a lot about what wilderness is in the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, and what wild spaces are. He's an explorer and has traveled to many remote places and has some really amazing stories, including one that I absolutely loved with a polar bear. At one point, I do say about your, his fourth book coming out. I thought he said fourth book, but he has authored 15 books. So I want to clear that confusion up right here. And I apologize for making that mistake. You're going to love this wide ranging conversation with a science writer, a former national park ranger, author, and explorer, John Waterman. Hi, John. Welcome to the podcast. I am so happy that you're here. Hi, it's a pleasure to be with you. You have a, a big career. You've done a lot of amazing things, written a lot of books. You worked as a National Park Service Ranger. Can you tell us how you got into this field, working with the natural world in the first place? I um, followed a rather unconventional path and re really have followed my bliss and my passions for the last half century. I have always loved wild places. So the book that I've just released is really has only been a couple of years work in writing, but it's really essentially been a lifetime's worth of research. I got into this business because as a teenager growing up in the Boston area, I was disenchanted with the suburbs and the city life and the, a conventional career. So I decided I wanted to be an adventurer. I wanted to spend my time traveling and being in wild places. And I knew at a very young age also, I was fortunate in that I knew that I wanted to share these places and eventually developed some writing skills and have always taken pictures. So the two went hand in hand, of course, with sharing it. And I was also an environmentalist from a, a young age and was struck by the need to save wild places, to save the environment growing up as a teenager in the 70s. So that informed and steered a lot of my career path. So what were your first career steps? Because like you said, you wanted to be an explorer or an adventurer. And I graduated high school in the late 90s. And even then... We had the internet, but it wasn't like really what it was today. And I didn't really know about career options other than, you know, like lawyer, doctor. So I didn't know that being a wildlife biologist was an option. So did you know like what your options were and how to go about in that career? Did you have any ideas of what the first steps were? It was much simpler than that. I came from a well-educated family. My father was a world-renowned mathematician, PhD, my mother and brothers also got good educations, but I was not interested in a conventional education. I didn't go to college. As Herman Melville wrote in one of my favorite books, Moby Dick, a whale ship has been my Harvard and Yale. So I single-mindedly set out at first really chasing my own dreams and climbing mountains. I was a mountaineer. I went climbing on climbing expeditions and trips around the world to the Himalayas uh, and Europe and Scotland and, of course, throughout North America. The colder, the better. I, I liked glaciated mountain ranges. We're opposite. We yeah. live in the Southwest now, and I love <laughs> the desert, and I've spent a great deal of time in the desert as well. But because I was an environmentalist, there was always that background niggling at me. Uh, will this place be here 100 years from now? I would ask myself. And so that really began to inform my career too. And I started writing. I started, I published my first book when I was a park ranger. I only got a job as a park ranger because I had skills as a climber. 
and they needed a climber to round out the rescue team in Denali National Park in Alaska. So I became a mountaineering ranger. And after my first year there, I was struck by the pattern behind accidents on Denali, a mountain we used to call Mount McKinley. And my boss gave me the green light to write a book that identified the patterns behind accidents. And I had a great deal of experience in that mountain because I also had guided it before I did rescue work. And it's really the most important book that I've written, at least not in terms of the environment, but in terms of providing a service to a reader, saving lives. It was subtitle for that book, Surviving Denali, could have been How Not to Die on Mount McKinley. Mm -hmm. But I realized that I could do a lot more with my writing. And it's, it was very hard to be an environmental writer, particularly in the 80s, when I really started uh, spending all of my time writing. I quit the park service to write for a living. And when you're writing about the environment, you're writing to a very narrow niche audience. Uh, and it's a little bit different today. It's a little bit easier, but it wasn't so easy then. But I continued to follow my bliss and spend time on, for lack of a better word, what I would call immersion journeys, not expeditions usually, long trips, and really getting to develop a sense of place about many places that went on to inform me as a writer and an environmentalist, and eventually began hanging out with lots of scientists and learning some of the deeper values behind wilderness preservation. And I would do trips that were very much had a, an agenda to them. I ran the Colorado River, for instance, from source to sea a dozen years ago uh, because I wanted to understand why where all the water went to and why we couldn't have a big hoop garden in my backyard. Uh, and so I spent five months on the river and then months afterward going back and exploring and taking lots of airplane rides to see the river and its tributaries and diversions. Wow. And that was a project that I did for the National Geographic, one of several. Uh, so I would just dive deep into these issues Rather than being a traditional journalist, I would go live in the outdoor uh, and ask a lot of questions. So that was what I brought to the issue. And I had the luxury of being able to take the time because I, did, I lived very cheaply and, and did then. And my career has only recently begun to take off because it's hard being a full-time writer, a freelance writer in particular. Yeah. And for your first book, let's go back there. How did that happen? So did you came up with the idea? And then because back then you definitely needed a publisher. Now you can self-publish. But how did that process work? Or were you approached by a publisher? Can you tell me more about that? No, it was entirely my own idea. One of my jobs as a, a nearing ranger was my title. Uh, I was actually offered a permanent job by the Park Service, and I loved the work. It was the best job I'd ever had in my life. Uh, we lived, we spent a lot of time on the mountain, and when we were on the mountain, we were out in the back country, or we were flying in, in helicopters and airplanes doing rescues. It was very exciting. But because I'd been on the mountain several times before I had the job as a Park Service ranger, the very first year I worked as a ranger, I began quickly to identify these patterns, people increasingly making the, the same mistakes, for instance, acclimating before they went to altitude and then getting altitude sickness or falling into crevasses because of uh, improper rope technique and climbing in the wrong places and getting caught in avalanches. So I broke, I conceptualized the book in my mind before I proposed it of a book full of each chapter would be a type of accident, avalanches, crevasse falls, high altitude pulmonary edema, et cetera. And then went to my boss and uh, in the park service and said, I'd like to write a book. It would really, we could save lives and it would make our jobs easier. And he said, sure, if you can find a publisher, go for it. I'll give you a research assistant. And I, I had written a little bit. I'd written a couple of art, small articles for the National Geographic News Service and was a freelancer here and there. But I didn't have the, the cred as a writer. But I found a small press that agreed to publish the book. And that winter, I, while 
not working for the Park Service. I wrote a book and the next year it came back and the book was released. And it's been in print ever since. It came out in 1983. And I, I really don't make any money from the book, but it's in my mind, one of the best things I ever did because I so precisely identified at who my audience was never destined to be a bestseller, but perhaps has saved a few lives. Yeah, definitely. You're talking about how the audience changed between then and now, or how now it's easier to reach a wider audience. Can you tell us more about that, about how your career as a writer has changed from when you first started out till now? Well, as you mentioned, it is easier to self-publish, which is something I've never done. Because there's so much effort involved in researching and writing a book, I couldn't imagine having to do the marketing and the sales as well. So it's easier now because they're, for one thing, not necessarily because people are more concerned about the environment. I may have misspoken earlier, but there are simply more people out there in those places that I write about. I published a book three years ago that became very successful very much like the latest book, Atlas of the National Parks, which is to everyone's surprise, is a sixty-five dollar book sold has sold over sixty-four thousand copies, which is kind of unprecedented. Uh, but this is it's not because I would like to believe the writing is brilliant and illuminating, but it's really because people love national parks and people are going to national parks in droves in a way that They've never gone to parks before. I don't believe they're going to wilderness areas, which is the subject of my latest book, but they go to national parks because national parks have this infrastructure and concessions and interpretation. So it's a natural draw for anyone from beginners to experts. It's a great American institution. Yeah, definitely. Can you talk about your new book and what do you mean by wild America? And when you're talking about wilderness areas, how do you define wild areas? Well, the, the strictest definition of wilderness comes from the legislation in 1964, the, the uh, Wilderness Act. The act went through years and years. I think there were 54 drafts of the act before it finally was voted on in Congress and passed. But it was, it was a, just a really a half dozen pages legislation. And it defined wilderness generally as uh, places untrammeled where man would only be a temporary visitor and the wildlife and the resources could be kept in their most pristine state. And so that was the criteria, general criteria for selection of 41 places. I identified 41 places throughout the continent, including three in Mexico and five in Canada, that I felt um, if they weren't legislated wilderness and protected by some federal agency, that they uh, embodied the wilderness values, uh, that they were remote and hard to access. They had no motorized vehicle use within and, and had these pristine and even spiritual values to them. And that, that was not an easy thing to define. I lay it out in the front matter of the book about what that criteria is, but it, it can be a it's, wilderness is a slippery construct. It's not necessarily a, a well defined geographical destination. It's a, a place you have to go there to decide whether it, it has the values of, of, of uh, wilderness as defined in the Wilderness Act. Yeah, I've even heard some people say that they don't believe that there is like a wild anymore. What do you think about that? Well, it's a great question. And and so I have to dig a little bit deeper to answer you. And I think that the heroes of the wilderness movement back in the 50s and 60s had a much sort of altruistic, purer view of wilderness that wasn't quite in line with reality. And the reality is that there may have been as many as 60 million Native Americans on this continent before colonization, mm -hmm. that much of the continent before diseases and before Native Americans were moved onto reservations was inhabited by uh, Native Americans who were really true stewards of the land. And, and Lewis and Clark, when they crossed this vast continent from St. Louis to the Pacific Ocean, 
they ran, ran into more than 50 tribes. And many of those places today are, in fact, uninhabited, except when you come to a, a town. So wilderness, in its true state, that in, in, on, even here in the New World of North America, was inhabited for a very long time. But it was arguably taken better care of before the days of the Industrial Revolution. So should humankind be a part of wilderness? Not as we define it nowadays, because we've kind of distilled it into our own, we have the, our own definitions of it. But in Alaska, it's quite interesting because they have a different interpretation of wilderness and they allow subsistence use of wilderness by not only uh, the native Alaskans, but by any people who choose to live out on the land off the grid. And they make exceptions to the Wilderness Act. And part of the Wilderness Act reads where humankind is only a visitor. And that's not necessarily true in many of these Alaskan wilderness areas, which are arguably the greatest wilderness that we have because they're so pristine, relatively pristine and undeveloped. There are Native Americans that routinely go out and hunt upon the land. What is your hope for this book? Do you, what do you want people to take away from it? And if there's some sort of like action or message that you would like them to be left with, what is that? Well, the book is not a guidebook. It's a veritable coffee table without the legs because it's nearly seven pounds. It's a huge book. I was gonna, I'm definitely going to show it my intro. It's a beautiful. Don't strike yourself, please. <laughs> but so I, to answer your question, it is a celebration of wilderness. And what I hope is that whether it's the old hands who are frequent visitors who like to go into the wilderness to fish or hunt or just revel in, in wild places, is that people will, will come to understand the spiritual values and the importance of wilderness to, our, to the world, not only for humankind's sake, but for the sake of the wildlife and the resource, the trees. I mean, forests uh, help our carbon sinks and they help mitigate uh, climate change, the greenhouse gases. So we need wilderness. Henry David Thoreau put it so well more than a century ago, in wildness is the preservation of the world. And he meant that both spiritually and uh, pragmatically, physically, that, that an intact nature makes for an intact world. How do you think the wild places or the wilderness areas in the United States compare to the national parks? Like just from maybe a visitor perspective, can you explain that a little bit? Well, it's interesting because many national parks have wilderness areas within them. Mm -hmm. And parts of the national parks that have wilderness within them actually don't have roads. And they, they tend to be sort of sectioned off from you know, the wilderness section of Yosemite National Park it, it isn't in the valley where the, the roadway is. But strictly speaking, I, know, I understand your question. Wilderness areas are places that you can go to that are not really maintained, unlike national parks. Now, wilderness in national parks is also not maintained. They have standards. There are four federal agencies that maintain wilderness, legislated wilderness areas. And there are more than 800 wilderness areas in, in our country. And th they, for instance, cannot use chainsaws or helicopters or any mechanical motors or motorized vehicles, for instance, to widen a trail. They generally don't, won't build new trails at all. They have to go with what's existing. And they, if they need, if a bridge is washed out, if there was a, even a bridge, and many wilderness areas won't build bridges. Um, they will only use the native timber, the surrounding timber, rather than if they can't fly it in, they can't use chainsaws to cut it down. So there are these wonderful sorts of values that are, are being abided by. Some of them are a little bit arbitrary, uh, you know, because and things are grandfathered in. If there are mining claims in some of these wilderness areas, they've been left open. The government uh, the Department of the Interior and others have tried to acquire these parcels, these inholdings within wilderness, so that they can keep the parcel completely wild. 
But does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. Can, can people visit wilderness areas? Can they like hike wilderness areas? Is that allowed? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There, there are no, really no wilderness areas that are closed. However, there are places that have become quite popular. And I've included several in my book. For instance, the John Muir Wilderness is High Sierra of the California, the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge in Georgia. This an amazing blackwater swamp or the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness in Minnesota. Those areas are incredibly popular and beloved by peoples in, in those regions. So you, to get in there, you have to have a permit. In many cases, you have to get a permit almost a year in advance oh, wow. to get access, just because they're so popular. But I am all for the permit system when these places are reach the point of a carrying capacity, and, and there are more people in there than they can maintain. Yeah. Um, Can you tell us about your process writing the book? Like, did you travel to all these different areas? And how do you like, just how is your whole process for coming up with a book that covers, you know, all of North America or lots of places in North America? Well, I had to be all inclusive. I couldn't, even though a wilderness area in Alaska is very different from a wilderness area, say the Cranberry Wilderness in West Virginia. I wanted to include places on the eastern seaboard, even though they were relatively close to large population centers, because um, wilderness is wilderness if it's well-maintained, and particularly if it's legislated wilderness, and they will abide by the principles of wilderness. So I selected a half dozen areas on the east coast, near pop relatively near to population centers, because they were wild. And... Is in terms of the process, before I selected any areas, I developed the criteria, uh, seven or eight points, and, you know, relatively untrammeled, remote or relatively inaccessible, a lack of any sort of road beyond a dirt road, no vehicle traffic allowed. And, it, you know, if there are large wildlife populations, I, I would factor that in. And then I took that lens and sort of used it, focused it on the entire continent to select those areas. And I couldn't actually visit them all. I didn't want to just include the places that I had the time to visit or that I had visited. So I included some places that I knew were, you know, the, the ideal of wilderness. For instance, the northern tip of Banks Island in Canada, in the Canadian archipelago. Banks Island has a park called Alavik National Park. And it's a place I've always wanted to go to. If 36 people have been there this year, it's a big year for Olavic National Park because it's so hard to get to. You have to fly a couple of different airplanes to get there. And then once you're there, of course, there are barren ground grizzlies and you might run into a polar bear. It's not a place that, even though it's a Canadian National Park, that's going to draw a lot of people. So, of course, I had to include it. And so on and so forth. But many of the places I did visit repeatedly, some of them I went to just for the purposes of the book. Many I overflew. I chartered uh, small planes and flew over them, both for the purposes of better understanding them, because you get up in the air and you suddenly have a bird's eye view and a, the landscape is laid out in a way that gives you a better understanding of the place, but also to take photographs. And many of my photographs were used in the book which I'm really honored about because it's hard to publish with National Geographic. It's one thing to write for National Geographic. It's entirely another thing to uh, photograph for them. So it's I'm like honored. Com competitive to photograph for them? Yeah, it's very competitive. And, you know, of course we wanted the best photographs. I didn't want them to use my photos unless they were as good as anything else they could find. And I was very clear about that. And uh, I believe that they help by that standard. They, I mean, they have a, a reputation to uphold, I guess. Yeah, they're a very prestigious organization. How did you first start working with them? Because you've also written articles for the magazine in addition to books. Well, I, I have never written uh, for the magazine in all the years that I've worked for them. Well, it's a an easy assumption for people to make because the magazine is the most visible aspect of the society. But they have many other media divisions. They have children's magazines. Of course, they have television and they have a books division. And mostly I, this is book that you just held up is the third book that I've done for them. And I'm 
now working on the fourth. But to answer your question, I first went, my first grant for them, which they, I've gotten three grants for them over the years. Uh, and when you get a grant, they will pay all the expenses uh, for a project, for an un ambitious undertaking that fits their criteria. And they then in turn will mine every potential bit of media you can create. And since I took pictures and knew how to make films and write, um, they gave me a grant. And it was a marvelous project. The concept was that I would take the world's most famous wildlife biologist, a man named George Schaller, who's mm -hmm. become a good friend, who saved more wildlife around the world than any human being alive. But his first trip, was into the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge the year that I was born, 1956. Wow. And in that year, with other scientists, he, his work led to the creation of one of our greatest wilderness areas, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. So my idea was that I travel with George exactly 50 years later, and we find a team of graduate students, wildlife biologists, graduate students, like he was 50 years ago, and travel with them so that George would then be the mentor instead of the student, and that we would all learn from George. And I was the fly on the wall organizing this meet. And we started by visiting with scientists in Fairbanks, and then we drove to, the, to a, a research station in the Arctic and learned about climate change. This was in 2000. And then we continued to Prudhoe Bay and and the oil company granted us interviews, so we learned about oil development and its potential repercussions or what the oil company felt were its benefits. And then we went to two different uh, native villages, and then we, we spent uh, weeks in the wilderness, floating down a river and climbing mountains, all with George, who was 74 years old at the time. I just heard from him a couple of days ago. He's now 90. He's lamenting that COVID has kept him from traveling for the last few years. But anyways, that was my first project for the National Geographic. And George and I lectured together about the trip. And I went on a, a nationwide lecture campaign to share the splendors of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and talk about whether it should be developed or not. Of course, I was, I'm, not, I'm opposed to oil development in the refuge. And, and so the National Geographic very quite happily uh, sponsored me because they knew that I would create a, a lot of media and I would champion a, a cause that they too believed in. So you basically came up with this idea and then wrote and submitted a grant. Yes. Yeah. For, yeah. For those of you who don't know, National Geographic has a bunch of different types of grants. They have research grants. And then this, I'm guessing, was like an explorer grant where they fund kind of like an expedition or a story about exploring interesting places? Yes, it was an explorer's grant rather than a science grant. The National Geographic had long, you know, recognized George, this man, George Schaller, and his work. So they're anxious to, to give me the green light. That's great. And what kind of, so if somebody wants to go about doing that, what kind of credentials do you think you need to be able to write and submit a grant to be taken seriously by the society? Well, the, I mean, probably better credentials than mine. My best credential was tenacity. I just mm -hmm. badgered the National Geographic to no end. And they, they finally had to give me a grant when I came up with that particular idea. I mean, I threw many ideas at them, and that was the first one that really stuck. You know, I proposed riding a horse from the southern tip of Patagonia to Central America, or, or and many things like that. But it was the trip with George Schaller to the Arctic that, that really made sense to them. And that led to a couple of other projects that were really engaging for me. I love that it was about tenacity. And by tenacity, do you mean you just kept applying for grants over and over again? Or did you actually email people? And like, what I would that email people and visit them in their offices. And, wow. and I had, by that point in 2006, I had published more than a few books. So I, I, you know, at that point I did, I was underselling my credentials. I, I was a published author and I was, had traveled extensively in the Arctic. Several years earlier, I had traveled mostly alone more than 2000 miles across the Arctic 
to learn about Inuit culture, which, which is a trip they did not sponsor. So I think they knew that they had missed at least one opportunity with me. Tell us about some of your travels. Like what, like how remote of the places that you've been to, like what is it like to travel to really remote places? And if you have interesting stories, close animal encounters, anything, I'd love to hear more about that. Well, I've had many. I'm sure you have. <laughs> it's hard to pick one, but I just mentioned this trip across the Arctic and mostly alone and alone by profound solitude. I mean, in the Arctic, in the Canadian Arctic in particular, there's n you're not even under jet paths, so you don't see contrails. And at one point, I went for 29 days without seeing or talking to another person, letting alone seeing a boat or a plane. I had no sat phone. And I developed a very sharp sixth sense. I'm not saying this with any poetic liberty either. I knew when I was near an animal. I, and I didn't think that I was smelling them or hearing them. I could just sense the presence of another animal. And that's one of the joys of wilderness, I guess, is that you develop an intuition if you spend enough time out there, particularly if you're alone, and you become intuitive about the things around you, about the potential dangers, usually. And I believe that we all have that innate sense within us, that if our ancestors were hunters who lived on the land in the wilderness and I think that we all have the potential to develop that. And again, that's one of the joys of wilderness. But I wanted to tell you on the end of that trip, after many profound experiences in solitude, repeatedly encountering bears, mostly grizzly bears, and some amazing encounters with Inuit people, whom I learned a lot from, I was concerned about whether I should continue another 200 miles to the next village. And Winter was coming, the sea ice was coming, and I had reached the Atlantic tides, which was my goal to paddle from the Pacific to the Atlantic tides. And it was very dangerous paddling to, because there were big currents and icebergs that I was paddling around. And I paddled around a, a point, and there were a lot of seals around there, and I was seeing polar bears in the distance. But I hadn't seen one close. I'd seen them over the previous couple of weeks. It was very nerve wracking. And I paddled around the point and all of a sudden I was right next to a polar bear sitting on a small iceberg with a seal. And the polar bear immediately jumped in the water to, and started swimming after me. And you can't, I knew that I couldn't paddle the polar bear, but I did. I started paddling frantically to get away. And I checked myself. I stopped because I knew that I couldn't get away and that there was a better way to do this. And I couldn't, I had a shotgun, but it was buried in my kayak and I didn't want to shoot a bear, of course. But the bear had, had signaled that I was prey by fleeing from it. And I had to, to send out a different signal. So I stopped paddling and spun the kayak around to face the bear and put my hands down and sort of took a picture with a camera, not being disrespectful about it, and then bowed to the bear, which stopped swimming after me as I turned to face it, because it suddenly just, I stopped acting like a prey species. And it was a powerful moment because there was a kind of a communication between that polar bear and myself. Uh, even though it had a, a seal that it was eating, I showed the bear respect. And the bear turned around and cl climbed back up onto the iceberg. And I bowed one more time, and then I realized that was the end of my trip. I turned around and headed back to the last village rather than continuing onward. That's all that I needed. So you're like, I've had enough. Wow, that's an incredible story. I'm actually really surprised that the bear went after you, even though it had a meal. That's pretty surprising. Yeah, and, and bears will do that. Even the grizzly bears, you know, they'll defend their, their food. It's a very bad thing to get near a kill. Yeah. And it's funny to think about, like, I know, like, good bear behavior is, you know, to not run away and to, like you said, like, freeze. And But it's funny, like, I don't think about that in the water. Like, if you're paddling away, it's, like, similar to, like you said, running away and, like, a prey initiation response. And so when you were alone for all this time, were you scared? Like, how did you feel being alone and in solitude? <laughs> 
aside from like close animal encounters, just like the everyday life. So the way it worked is that every time I would resupply in villages and sometimes the villages were as far apart as 400 miles. It would take me a full month to go that far in a kayak, particularly when the weather wasn't. And I'd get into a village and it completely, I would be so overjoyed to be around people and I'd start talking again. And then I'd have to leave. And it was very difficult to leave a village because I, in the, the art, in the Canadian Arctic in particular, the people don't travel very far from their villages. They're very uh, focused on community. And so I knew that I wouldn't be seeing people after, as soon as I got a day's paddle away. So I was filled with anxiety and consternation and, and really frightened about bears, particularly grizzlies, because they're very aggressive in the north much more so than down south because there's so little food for them. And I would get myself so worked up, I wouldn't sleep at night, just worried about bears or about the weather, or about whether the ice pack would blow in and trap me. And, and this would go on for about a week, 10 days. And then I'd get to a point where I'd become so exhausted and so anxious that I'd finally just sleep a long night. And then I began to relax, and it, th this happened several times to me, several times after leaving three villages, and I went into another state of awareness where I began to listen very carefully and relax, and it's, I'm certain that the animals knew this because every time I got more than a week away from the village, routinely had seals swimming up next to me. A wow. caribou would come down to the beach and just watch me rather than running away. And the bears were a bit different because bears tend to be, they're big, high and much higher on the food chain than I am. But, but at one point I knew that I was on a beach with a bear and I didn't see it or hear it. And I had to race it to my kayak to get in the water first. But it, it was a profound experience for me. It was the recognition of my own intuition, which I didn't know that I had, and that the animals could sense in me as well. Wow, that's amazing. When you went to the local villages, were they used to people from other areas? Or was that like <laughs> new for them? Yeah, but, but you had people are very sophisticated people, and many of them had traveled. But of course, many of them are poor. They live in welfare states for the most part. And I would have to say that if I had, and I have flown into villages before in a bush plane, just as a jumping off point or just to do a, some journalism work. And my reception was very different on those occasions when I just flew in like a tourist versus the time, the many times that I came paddling into a village alone in a kayak, which is the mythical tool of their ancestors. So I was so thankful because they were so gracious to me and would come and ask me questions. They're not people who are like to ask questions, but they made an exception for me because I was there to learn about the land and the sea and the animals and their culture. And they knew that when they <laughs> see me coming, you know, from the distance alone. And I tell them, you know, they ask me, where I'd come from. And I'd say, you know, Politak. Politak was 400 miles away. And they were fascinated, as what, I was with them. Yeah, absolutely. What advice would you have for somebody who wants to go into a career like this, either a writing career or just like working in remote areas as a park ranger? What kind of advice would you have? Well, I, if they're to follow my path, the only path that I know is that of passion. And I just, I just did what I wanted to do. I wanted to climb mountains and explore wild areas and learn how to kayak and sail and ski. And so uh, Joseph Campbell said it best when he said, follow your bliss. I didn't worry about making money, making a living. I never worried about that. And, and that by following my passion, I developed an expertise that made me invaluable that spun my clock, if you will. It kept me going. How, if you were interested in the environment and natural areas, how come you didn't decide to go the, the science route? Like, I know you didn't go to college, but what made you 
not think about that option. I tested well in school and was placed in an advanced program, but I despised classroom time. I couldn't sit in a classroom. I, I couldn't learn didactically. I, I don't have a learning disability, but I, I learn best by doing and by reading. I love to read. I'm a bit of an autodidact. So that, that as I like to tell my, one of my sons who is similar to me, that I treat it as a superpower. So I did. Can you explain what that is for people who might not know? Uh, being an autodidact? Yeah. I am very curious and learn on my own by myself and constantly asking questions. I can be annoying because it's a, a good thing for a journalist because I'm constantly asking questions. Because I'm genuinely curious. When I meet someone new, I ask them a lot of questions if I'm interested in them. Or even if I'm not. And it's a great way to get to know people, particularly if you're on a, an assignment. But it's completely genuine. Yeah, for me too. I, I love that too. And actually, when I was, I think I was 15, my dad had the Dale Carnegie book, How to Make Friends and Influence People. And for some reason, I read it. And so much of it was about asking people questions, like to, to like social, like to get people to like you. It's really about just having genuine interest in the other person and asking them questions. So for scientists, a lot of scientists aren't that social. So I was like the social butterfly of graduate school. And everyone's like, how do you do it? And I'm just like, I just ask people questions and I'm genuinely interested in the answers and then keep asking. People love talking about themselves. So it's really easy. Right. Yeah. And it's a great way to learn, you know? Yeah. And then uh, my final question is, what is your fourth book about and how do you decide what to write about? Um, well, I did two books simultaneously last year. I wrote another book that will be released next year, which is called okay. Into the Thaw. Sorry, I didn't mean fourth. You said fourth book. So do you mean fourth book in this series or? Sorry, um, I was going to clarify that. They have this book that just came out. It is the second of three atlases. And the third atlas, which I'm in the process of writing now, is the most challenging thing I've ever done. It is Atlas of Historic America. And wow. it's a, the history of the, of the USA from the time of the Bering Land Bridge to George Floyd. And I'm trying to do a book that includes all that history that I did not learn in school. Mm -hmm. An in-depth summation of the period of slavery, as well as the displacement of Native Americans and the diaspora of our country, the Asian immigration and the immigration of other peoples and just trying to tell the tell a history warts and all and the national geographic knows that it's time to do something like this and most history atlases or history books with a few exceptions haven't really told the full story so i'm not an historian by training but i'm just i'm curious and interested in history i've read a lot of history books so it's a very challenging project but again, it's an atlas with a lot of maps and a lot of illustrations, so it's it's right up my alley. But I took a I did a project more along the lines of what we've been talking about. Last year, I traveled to the Arctic to do a book on climate change in the Arctic, which is called Into the Thaw, and it's about my years of travel in the Arctic because I've been going to the Arctic since 1983. And I've seen extraordinary changes in the North in that time. And I hadn't really written, had the opportunity to write about them with much depth. So I went back on one final trip last summer. It was a very arduous trip with just one other guy. We met, I used the usual model. We met with a lot of scientists. And then we went on a long journey through gates of the Arctic National Park and Noatak National Preserve and uh, traveled in pack rafts, and covered hundreds of miles. And I spent a lot of time interviewing Inupiat people about their observations of climate change. And, and so that's a book that'll come out next year, very much along the model of my immersion style journeys to, to write a book. Exciting. We're looking forward to it. Thank you so much for this interview. It was fantastic to talk to you. I love your stories. Just what an interesting life that you've lived. And I highly recommend everyone get the book. It's a beautiful book.
Well, thank you. Thank you for your good questions as well. <laughs> thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you once again, John, for that amazing interview. The book again is Atlas of Wild America. I highly recommend it. It is a gorgeous book and I will put the link to it in the show notes. You can sign John online at jonathanwaterman.com. His last name is Water and Man, so it's pretty easy to spell, but you can find the link on show notes. Thank you so much. And one thing I just really want to talk about or add before we end is I just love John's explanation of the interaction with the polar bear and the unsaid silence but communication between them and i think as scientists a lot of times we forget or ignore that indescribable relationship or connection that we have with animals and nature but i've heard so many scientists talk about this so i just wanted to bring light to that and say that i love that and sometimes we can get so analytical and so into the data analysis and details that we forget about the spiritual sense of nature and wildlife. And that's something that I really am into and want to bring more into this podcast. So thanks again. And I look forward to seeing you here on the podcast again. Have an amazing day. Be kind to each other. Be kind to animals as always. Bye.